Welcome to Analog Jones and the Tempo Film. I'm Steve. And I'm Matt. And we're a vlog podcast. I don't know what we are. Who cares? We're on YouTube. This is fun. We're a, we're a media conglomerate. <laughs> we do really? it all. We do it all. We, where's the money, though? Yeah. <laughs> is my bank account going to change? <laughs> this week we're doing uh, video four of Tarantine Tober. Taren Tober. I don't know how I'm pronouncing it, even though I came up with it. But we're doing, uh, where's it at? We're doing four rooms four rooms so we're chronologically going after pulp fiction the mega hit masterpiece of tarantino to the movie that basically they had free reign to make because yeah. you know desperado was such a big hit and pulp fiction was such a big hit they were mm-hmm. like well you can do whatever the fuck you want and four rooms no. is a result of them getting to do whatever the fuck they wanted <laughs> yeah i i believe this like i knew they um I mean, one good thing about Robert Rodriguez is he really knows how to network when he met them. And I think he met them a lot of times in Toronto when he met Quentin Tarantino. And I guarantee if both of these movies came out of it. Yeah, like this is this is a, this is like uh, the first, I guess, collaboration of them because then we have From Dustle Dawn and we have uh, Grindhouse. Well, this is the first one where they directly work together uh, because uh, I think... Tarantino might have helped out something with Desperado, but this was like the same year as Four mm-hmm. Rooms, so I don't know. It, I, this might be the first one of their collaborations, though. Yeah. Well, it wasn't liked. No. This no. movie is not well-loved. This is not a beloved Tarantino one. We kind of are coming off of mm-hmm. the most beloved Tarantino one. Yeah, oh, I mean, it's Pulp Fiction. Maybe yeah. the like least liked Tarantino-involved thing. So go ahead and describe this this kind of really lame box art. Yeah, I mean, you you guys can see it, but for those who are just listening, uh, this is from the makers of Pulp Fiction, and it has, like Pulp Fiction, has the gigantic cast list at the mm-hmm. top part. Uh, they're really trying to make this like a Pulp Fiction thing. Um, comedy, confusion, and chaos, compliments of the house. Wildly outrageous, uh, Jeannie Wolf's Hollywood, uh, which I've never heard of. Four Rooms, a film by Alice Nanders, Alexander Rockwell, Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino, and then it's uh, Madonna, Marissa Tomei, uh, Antonio Banderas, and Tim Roth on the cover. Sort of their stars. Yeah. The, the most famous people well, in yeah, this. Well, yeah, Marissa Tomei makes no sense, but... Yeah, I Marissa mean, Tomei has a cameo in this yeah. movie. Uh, Madonna's in one of the stories, Antonio Banderas is in one of the stories, and then Tim Roth is our wraparound, because this is an mm-hmm. anthology movie. This is we were talking about it maybe outside of Twilight Zone. We didn't do research, because fuck that. Um, but, like... Uh, outside of Twilight Zone might be one of the only or the first anthologies that has different directors yeah I, I don't know yeah I remember talking about that uh, it's really interesting I don't know when anthology started to do that yeah this has got to be one of the fir- or at least one of the first 90s ones that did all the different directors for different stories so yeah if you don't know what this is about this is your description uh, from Roger Ebert, Chicago Sometimes, Antonio Banderas is hilarious. So just just one thing he liked about it, apparently. Yeah. And Antonio Banderas is in maybe five minutes of this. Mm, maybe, well, yeah, because he leaves the he story. Leaves. Yeah, leaves yeah, the yeah story. maybe he is. Uh, don't miss the fun in this hilariously sexy comedy that has Antonio Banderas' interview with a vampire, Madonna, a league of their own, uh, and a sizzling all-star cast checking in for laughs. It's Ted the Bell Hops, Tim Roth, Pulp Fiction, first night on the job, and the hotel's very unusual guests are about to place him in some outrageous predicaments. It seems that this evening's room service is serving up one unbelievable happening after another. Also featuring Marissa Tomei, my cousin Vinny, Four Rooms is a wild night of highly original comedy entertainment you'll enjoy without reservations. A wicked romp on the wild side, HBO. Haha, <laughs> without reservations. Mm-hmm. Get it? It's a hotel thing. So HBO said this is a wicked romp? Yeah, which I don't know who from HBO would say that because like HBO is not like a review thing. It's a channel, so I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> They're like, oh, we bought the rights to show this. so Yeah, we, we think it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can, yeah. we, can, can we get that on print before uh, it goes out? Sure. Yeah. Getting in the whole this thing, at the very beginning... Um, oh yeah, we gotta go through the trailers. I forgot the whole procedure here. So we we pop in the tape, and here's here's our first things. Of course, because it's super edgy, we have uh, mm-hmm. a book with a super offensive title. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Spike, Mike, uh, Slacker, and Dykes, uh, independent filmmaking book by John Pearson. Yep, and it's just you know about independent filmmaking which in I the nineties. Yeah, you know, 
I kind of want to get the book. What do Spike Lee, Michael Moore, and Kevin Smith have in common? The man Variety calls a guru, and Newsweek hails an angel. John Pearson helped get their career started, and now brings us the most definitive book on independent filmmaking. Spike, Mike, Slackers, and Dice, a guided tour through a decade of American cinema, available at bookstores everywhere. 3.6 out of 5 on Goodreads. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, this has got to be like one of those 90s, like independent cinema, mm-hmm. Sundancey, you know. It's so obviously Slacker's probably referenced the Linklater sl- Slacker. Spike is in reference to Spike Lee. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't remember who Mike was. They said it in the trailer, but I don't remember. But like they're obviously doing like a. 90s independent cinema when that was all all a rage for well, a yeah i mean when you had um mall rats and um clerks clerks especially oh yeah clerks yeah. is mm-hmm. they talk about that in there yeah i mean that's like clerks made a ton of money mm-hmm. and then later on in the 90s i know this is before but <clears throat> you know later on in the 90s you get uh the blair witch project yeah which, independent yeah. cinema was on fire in yeah. the 90s basically is what we're saying <laughs> And then it was gone for yeah, then a it, long time. Yeah, then it was gone. And then sort of the Sundance movie mm-hmm. became something else, which I think became very negative, where it's almost like a genre, where it's this melancholy dramedy mm-hmm. is sort of the Sundance <clears throat> genre that became a thing in the 2000s. And now I don't know where we're at. Now we're shooting movies on phones and it doesn't matter. So <laughs> Yeah, I don't really care. I think everyone, because of VOD... I think independent cinema has become so accepted inside. Yeah. Like, we don't even... Like, it is, obviously, independent cinema. But movies are just movies now. Movies, if, yeah. If we watch it, it's a movie. Like, and actually, that's it's great. A, that's great. Yeah, I, that's what... Hey, it's so cool now that we have yeah. the ability to access it on VOD. I, I love it. I don't turn away... I know some people will scoff from independent films. I don't get why. I, I never... If a good story is a good story, I'll watch it. Yeah, I... I I don't usually watch like kind of those mid level ones like the VOD straight to VOD movies, but I like like the backyard stuff. I'll seek that out. Like I like and because there's a lot of good stuff. Like I'm there's sure a there lot is. of bad stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff coming out of just like the, you know, shot on a phone <clears throat> in somebody's backyard with their friends. Movies. There's there's some cool stuff happening. Like people and they you know they can get them on Amazon. Well, they used to be able to get them on Amazon Prime or. Uh, yeah, now I don't know where they're at. The uh, True Indie is a really cool outlet for stuff like True that. True Indie, yeah, um, it, just, just pure, honest, independent stuff that, but that's like really cool that people are making. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, that's a, that's what I'm into now, and the fact that we have access to it is cool. So I think we have movies like I don't want to necessarily say Four Rooms, but the Tarantinos and the Kevin Smiths and the Richard Linklaters. We have them to thank for us getting to this point. I think, yeah. I mean, yeah, Reservoir Dogs. I, I, I'm sure that was made for nothing. Yeah. Five hundred thousand dollars, maybe. Probably less. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And that has kicked in the door for us to be able to get great filmmakers who don't have access to stuff that don't live in Hollywood to get, have their voices be heard. Yeah. And if you're wondering why we didn't do Reservoir Dogs, I don't own it. Me neither. I yeah. well, you is that the Blu-ray? Or I own the Blu-ray. Yeah, man. This... I have the DVD, so. But I, I just... mean, Blu-rays. Ugh. And I caught that one so much later. Like I, Pulp Fiction, I saw when it came out. I had it, you know. That like that was something uh, that was in my life. But like Reservoir Dogs, I didn't find till I was a teenager. Yeah, I really don't like it on this because it's too clear. (laughs) Yeah, you need the fuzz. (laughs) I need the fuzz to really encompass the movie. Yeah, especially that one. That's a grimy. Yeah, it's really good. If you haven't seen it. I'm surprised you're watching our show if you haven't seen something Yeah, like that. if you haven't seen But I would expect that you wouldn't have seen yeah. Four Rooms. So anyway, the trailers. <laughs> a lot of people haven't. Yeah, man, it took us a while to get to the trailers. But yeah, um, Train Spotting was next, which you noticed something right away about this trailer. It's a comedy they're advertising. <laughs> yeah. Which is, is not yeah. a comedy. It's There's some not. funny moments in that movie, yeah. but it's not a comedy at all. It is a dark, drug habit, bad, like times movie <laughs> well this is before american pie too right it's yeah like right before it so like to me i thought they were like oh let's uh take advantage of the 90s comedy you know the the teenage comedy no nope. and it's not at yeah all. it really is like look at how much fun these guys are having and it's like if you see that movie those guys are not having a good time <laughs> that is a yeah that's a messed up movie yeah and like all of them from that movie basically went on to have careers yep that, yeah, that was career launching for all every single one of those actors. And of course, you know, Obi-Wan. Yeah. The biggest. Ewan McGregor really yeah. blew up after that. 
But he, yeah, I mean, you could tell right away. That's why he was like the star of the movie. He's just so damn good. Yeah. It doesn't matter what role, he can find a way to disappear into it. Yep. Even though his face is so recognizable. Uh, and now his beard. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, getting past that into the next one, it was like one of the French uh, coming soon to video cassette we had from Dust Till Dawn. Yes, so, which we'll talk about. Yeah, it's fun. So, Pump Fiction, Pulp, I mean, Pump. Uh, Pulp Fiction, they had four rooms in it, right? Yeah, Pulp Fiction had the four rooms trailer. Four rooms has the From Dust Till Dawn yeah. trailer. That's great. I love that. <laughs> um, so, and then the the French twist, or yeah. French twist. So Which, I'm, I'm assuming Miramax is buying all these up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then we get into the movie. And now our feature presentation. Yeah, that's it. And then right away I was wondering, is Tim Roth trying to be like a silent character actor right because he's doing a lot of he's moving i i fucking love tim roth in this movie though actually i love his insane performance (laughs) Uh, yeah i mean it's better than you know the second of the stories i guess i i don't know to me i was like either be the i i kind of wish he wouldn't have talked throughout the whole film like just on the silent actor thing, mm-hmm. and I yeah, well, you made a good point because I said that this movie had reshoots specifically for the wraparound, mm-hmm. and you asked if they added the dialogue, and I, that's a good point. Like I wonder, I wonder if they did, but there's no information on the limited amount of research I did. On this. They mentioned Jerry uh, Jerry Lewis's performance uh, at the end in um, the bellhop, mm-hmm. so and that was a, he was silent the entire time. So maybe that's what they're kind of yeah. doing, and then they realize it didn't work, so they added dialogue. I don't know. But uh, I love him in yep. this. I, I, it's insane. It, it, the wraparound is really inconsequential, though, Like for the most part. They kind of jump right into the stories. Yeah, the, I mean, the first one... Well, they had the animated... Uh, yeah, they do the Pink Panther sequence. opening. I love uh, it. Which I is great. Yeah, I'm I all for it. Those. Uh, yeah, and then we get right into the honeymoon suite, the missing ingredient. Uh, Madonna shows up, which to me just like really sticks out like a sore thumb. I don't get why you'd I, I get why you'd want to put Madonna in your movie just because you just have that name and people would probably you know rent the movie or buy it, purchase it straight from that. Which her name isn't really on. No, it's not on the front. Her picture's not on the front. It's on the back, but like. I feel like after several bombs, like Shanghai Surprise and stuff like that in the early 90s, they were like, well, let's just not even put her. <laughs> yeah. She's in it. She's a star. We love her. But like, <laughs> yeah, so, it's not uh, advertising too hard. <laughs> uh, the director of this is written and directed by Allison Anders. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know anything else she's done? I've never seen anything else she's done. Uh, I know she's kind of a prominent uh, super indie uh, okay. Sundancey, right. you know she's of this class. She's definitely of this class of filmmakers. Uh, but I've just never seen any. She does dramas. I'm not. I'm uh, not into like '90s Sundancey dramas. I'm into more weird shit. Like is it this. like a dr- like dry dramas? Yeah, like a family dramas. It seems like oh, a lot family of, dramas. Yeah. Well, I don't want that. Uh, I live that. <laughs> But she's pretty. She's pretty well known. Uh, she still works. Uh, she kind of is one of those uh, super Sundancey indie uh, directors that transitioned into TV. Yeah, and okay. she works. So good for her. Uh, this story is okay. I don't yeah, mind this one. It's uh, fine. Ione Sky is randomly in it in Topless for some reason. Um, you may remember her from Say Anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, she's got to seduce the guy because they need Mm. semen is the missing ingredient. Yeah. It's so weird because two girls take off their tops, but not all of them. Yeah, it's like like, a really weird choice. I don't get, like, if there would have been a line of something or, like, we need the skin of a virgin or something, I don't know. I I just don't get it. Uh, Yeah, the whole thing, it's passable. Yeah, it's fine. What I... One thing I noticed about all the stories is, like, they're they're pretty generic, straightforward stories, but then they always just have to add, like, the level of edge. So they're like, so this is our story of, like, witches, and they're putting together something in this hotel room. And so, of course, the missing ingredient involves them having sex. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's and then And then, yeah. and then we'll, I'll talk about, like, each story has, you know, another level that, like, whether it's sex or violence is, like, turned up a little bit. Like, it's a kind of a normal story with an edge twist on it. 
Yeah, and the, they're like trying to bring back a witch that died. I don't know if it was in this hotel, whatever. I, they're in the same room, which, and, and of course, the witch, you know, was lesbian, so I guess that was supposed to be like, they're like edgy. Yeah. I, 90s edgy thing. Yeah, I was like, I, I don't know, maybe because it's so far in the future now that we're like, gay marriage is, you know, mostly. It's accepted. not edgy anymore. Like, like, we're just like, yeah, cool. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's all right. This maybe. story moves. Uh, the next one, Room 404, The Wrong Man. We talked about this beforehand. And I'm sure a lot of people agree. It's kind of the one where... When it's we the tried to most, guess... It's the most forgettable. Yeah, <laughs> we tried to guess uh, the segments in this movie before we watched it. And I completely forgot this one even existed. Yeah, no, I yep, uh, it, completely gone. And also, Alexander Rockwell is not a filmmaker. I don't know anything about him as a filmmaker. I don't even know what he's done. He's, if he's still doing you know, anything, I've never seen anything he's ever done. I don't know why he's in this group. <laughs> but the only part about the story that I kind of liked is it's where Tim Roth started to, like, turn it up. We don't have time to play charades here, you asshole. Untie me. Yes. I would appreciate it if you would tell that nutcase in there. He's making a big fucking mistake. Look, whether you like it or not... You are in the middle of a situation here you cannot just wish your way out of. But I've never met you people before! We're complete strangers! Everybody starts out as strangers, Ted. It's where we end up that counts. He's more involved in this mm-hmm. story, uh, I guess, than the other ones. Like, he's in all of them, but mm-hmm. his he, he's a central focal point of this, I guess. I don't know. He's, uh, he's a central focal point of all of them, but he's not. I don't know how to describe yeah. it. He floats in and out of the stories, basically. Yeah, I did this one. I forget the actor's name um, that's in it. The the male performer, uh, David Provel. Be sure. I don't, uh, I don't he's know been in is. the Sopranos. He's been in a lot of stuff. Uh, he's he's just one of those old school like seventies actors. And and Jennifer Beals is in this, which is good yeah. to see her. Uh, I love her and, from the eighties movies and stuff. So well, and she's good in this. It's like neither of them no one's bad in the segment <laughs> it's just the it needed something i yeah. don't know what it is it's just it's very forgettable yeah uh and then you know we move straight on to the third one and is by far my favorite mind you um is the misbehaviors yes uh the babysitting the kids mm-hmm. story with antonio Banderas, isn't it no i don't trust babysitters my children are safer alone and with some fucked up pedophile babysitter I don't know from the man in the fucking moon. What about him? What makes you think you can trust him? Tell me that's not a face you can trust. I'd love to help you with your problem, sir. Also, and uh, this one's really fun. Yeah. And the twist with the... the you, you guys will either never see this movie or have seen it, hopefully, if you're watching this. Um, the true. twist with yeah. the uh, hooker in the bed is really fucking oh, That last shot? It's really great. Did they misbehave? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, dead hooker in there. But uh, one thing always gets me is like when Tim Roth is like, I'll bring you milk and cookies. <laughs> he brings him milk and saltines. Those aren't milk and cookies. Well, we ran out of cookies. So I bought you... Milk and saltines. Now don't complain. Hurry up and eat. You're going to bed. They're old. Dip them in the milk. The milk will make them soft. <laughs> no crackers? Sleepy time. Yeah, this one's fun. This yeah. one this one really lights the movie up. Like, this is the best one by far. Uh, I could watch this segment again. You know, yeah, like, four, four rooms I maybe watch every 15 years. But, like, this segment yeah. I could watch again. It's super fun. It's it's really fun. Um, <clears throat> and it's just kind of inventive. Like, how they set up the smell at the mm. very beginning, and then finally they get to the... What does he call her? Yeah, he, and the, the little girl gets really mad. He's like, there's a dead... Well, uh, the, gr- the girl keeps saying whore. Is that, is that no, what no. they... Or does he say whore? And she gets mad at it. Uh, he keeps calling it I don't whatever remember. it is. I don't visit, but she throws... She basically stabs him with the syringe. Which is pretty messed up when you think about it. And what I also love is we never find out why there's a dead prostitute. <laughs> they don't even... They're like, move on. Yeah. 
No, on. this is this is a fun one. Rodriguez yeah. is having fun, and he's he's clearly at the you know top of his game here. Mm-hmm. This is this is right after Desperado, right before from Dusk Till Dawn. He's like on fire here. <laughs> and the, the girl dancing on the TV because they had the, the nudie. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's Selma Hayek. Nice. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting, and he doesn't even show her face. Nice. That's yeah. It's like, hmm. I don't know if that was on purpose. Maybe she's like, I'll do it, but. Yeah, yeah, don't show my face. Yeah, I'm not ever gonna get credit for it, so like, yeah, I'll just do it as a favor. Um, so, but this one also has another. We we talked about it in Pulp Fiction. This one has another appearance by Kathy Griffin too. In this one, yeah, this is uh, coming up. This is when Tim Roth's character is broke. Yeah, he is just flipping out. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, he just puked oatmeal out of his mouth in the segment. I don't know what is in there, but it looks like oatmeal that he's like, Bleh! uh, yeah, he flips out, but this is when we get, um, I just, uh, her name's escaping me, uh, Marissa Tomei. Yeah. As a crackhead. Happy New Year. Let me speak to Betty. Uh, party's over. She probably went home. She lives there. Yeah. 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 I know. Well then get on the phone. Tell her it's an emergency. Who, who should I say is calling? You tell her it's Teddy from work. On the phone and there's a major fucking emergency. Hi, Ted. I'm Margaret. You sound down. Has this not been the happiest of New Year's? No, Margaret. This hasn't been my happiest New Year. This one's starting off pretty fucking badly. Oh, how come? Well, Betty leaves me here all by myself. And first thing, right off the bat, I'm fucked. By a coven of witches. You were fucked by an oven full of witches? A coven of witches! Not an oven! Well, one witch in particular. Was she an old hag with a mole on her face with hair growing out of it? No, no, she was very beautiful. Ted! What's the problem? Right, no, isn't that? Isn't I thought that... she was just smoking dope. She's high. I thought she was supposed to be like a crack smoking person i thought that's what they were going for she's really tame for smoking crack (laughs) well it's also like kind of a tame movie in terms of like what it's kind of going for (laughs) she's doing some kind of drugs and i do love how she's looks for kathy griffin's character and like then you realize they're not even friends she's just at that house okay ted what's the problem hello betty what's the problem i haven't got a problem I've got fucking problems. Plural. Wanna hear? Sure. Well, most recently, there's room 309. There's this scary Mexican gangster dude poking his finger in my chest. There's this hooligan kid snapping their fingers at me. There's a putrid, rotting corpse of a dead horse stuffed in the springs of the bed. There's rooms blazing a fire. There's a big, fat needle from God knows where stuck in my leg, infecting me with God knows what. And finally, there's me, walking out the door, right fucking now. Buenas noches. Oh, I guess New Year's Eve, it happens, but it's weird. And they're playing Sega. Did you notice that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, love, I was like, I want to play Sega now. <laughs> but yeah. I, I had a Genesis. That was good times. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the penthouse calls. He says he's quitting. She's like, take care of that, and then you can leave. And then we get... Like, I, I'm split on this one. I like it, and there's parts of it I don't. Yeah, this one, so, like, the movie sets it up as all roads lead to this. This yeah. is the Tarantino one. This is right after Pulp Fiction. Anticipation's high. We're jumping in to Tarantino. Like, we're going mm-hmm. into like, the Tarantino story. Every, anticipation's high. What's his follow-up to Pulp Fiction going to be? And it's kind of it's just okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I do like the end, like, shock of it yeah uh, i do like how they set up everything so they're all talking he's drinking champagne uh tarantino is playing tarantino basically mm-hmm. uh bruce willis is playing bruce willis <laughs> i guess uh he's he's got a different look to him like with the uh goatee and yeah. the, the the glasses like and Bruce Willis isn't even credited in the movie, so it's just like kind of a cameo, but he's in yeah. this story. Uh, yeah, this one, it's based on both uh, Tarantino's student film. Uh, that He wasn't like a film student, but like student era film. Yeah, His video like, store days, I should say, film, uh, which is, what's it called? My Best, best Friend's Birthday or something like that. Um, or My Friend's Best, yeah, Best Friend's Birthday, I think it is. And then uh, an Alfred Hitchcock Presents 
uh, episode with okay. Peter Lorre, um, right. where they have to cut somebody's finger off. Um, so it's based on both of those things. Okay. So he gets kind of remake his first movie and do uh, Alfred Hitchcock thing. And it's, like I said, just okay. It's the camera work at the front portion of this that just, like, I thought it was Robert Rodriguez shooting it. Because, uh, I mean, if you know anything about Robert Rodriguez, he's the king of holstering it on his own shoulder. And basically everything's handheld. Uh, usually he uses very few dollies early in his work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, um, he's very frenetic, yeah. very handheld. Yeah, but this is actually Tarantino's usual yeah. cinematographer, his Which 90s cinematographer. Because at the very beginning, when he's like really close to Tarantino, it makes me very uncomfortable. Like, <laughs> mm. And it looks very um, amateurish with how shaky it is at one point. Now, did I miss at the beginning where they're like telling a guy to record the whole thing? Was that on purpose? Okay, so it was just... I don't know. Right. <laughs> I'm impressed the long takes. Yeah. That everyone got their stuff right. You know, everyone got their lines right. Uh, so I'm impressed with that. But, you know, you get to the end, you see Bruce Willis fighting with his wife, and then the guy, which I've never seen that actor, who had to do the lighter ten times in a row. I don't know if that was one of... He's a character actor. Yeah. But he's one of the Tarantino uh, usuals, uh, Paul Cal- He's in Pulp Fiction. Paul Calderon, he's a, he's the bartender, uh, in oh yeah, yeah you're right yeah yeah and he also is the guy who goes to look for the boxer at the end of the match yeah okay all right so he's one of Tarantino's like friends probably yeah, yeah. he's he's done and he's mm-hmm. just a character actor he's good but he, yeah, yeah, yeah. in this you know he hasn't got a ton to do <laughs> he's got to light his his Zippo ten times in a row without failing and he would win. The man from Hollywood, Tarantino's car. If he didn't, Tim Roth would get a chunk of money. And the setup to get Tim Roth to do this, it took a while. Ted, pay attention here. I'm going to make two piles here on the bar. One pile, which is yours, and another pile, which could be yours. And what you have to realize is we're going to do this thing one way or the other. Whether it's you who holds the axe, or a Mexican maid, or some bum when you go up the street. You can buy a whole lot of soup with that pot. Shh. I'm going to close it here, all right? Now, I'm a little... Me- um, I've lost count. How much is on the bar here? 600. Okay. Ted, do you know how long it takes the average American to count to 600? It's a rhetorical question, Ted. No, sir. About one minute less than it takes to count to 700. Now, Ted, a person's life is filled with a zillion little experiences, some which are insignificant, have no meaning, and, you know, you forget them. Others which you remember for the rest of your natural life. Now, since what we're proposing here is so unusual, so outside the norm, that this is a good bet that this is going to be one of those incidences that sticks. So, since you're going to be stuck remembering this for the rest of your life, you have to decide what that memory will be. So, Ted, are you going to remember for the next 40 years, give or take a decade, that you refused a thousand dollars for one second's worth of work, or that you made a thousand dollars for one second's worth of work. Time. So Ted, what's it gonna be? Okay. You know, it's just like here's three hundred dollars to listen to our tale. Here's two piles. You could have this if you don't do it, or you know whatever, and then you can have it all if you cut off his finger. If. He can't do it. And the and the gimmick on this is the first time he fucks up and Tim Roth just like, at this point it's broken, doesn't give a shit, goes, bye. Yeah. And that's kind of our shock yeah. moment in this, the violence, the no, Tarantino get, violence. Like, the first time it got me, I was like, what? Whoa. They did it. Uh, but now, you know, the shock's kind of worn off. And I still like that they do it. I think it's clever. I just, the whole story wasn't, you know, it's, it's passable. It's kind of good. It's just... The yeah. whole movie as a whole doesn't work. Because then I think, you know, they're like, oh, God, I caught my finger. we got to go to the ambulance. And then after that, it just, it just ends, right? Yep, that's it. So, yeah. I I have a feeling, and I, I don't know this, but I have a feeling because Pulp Fiction and they were probably, you know, Tarantino was probably working on Jackie Brown and Rodriguez was working on From Dusk Till Dawn. Uh, but they weren't ready yet. I feel like the Weinsteins or or Tarantino, I don't know, um, wanted to get another movie out right away. 
Because this feels kind of rushed. It does. It, it feels, feels like... very fast, and it's like, yeah, we're good, but we're not that good. Type, you know, like we're 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 riding high right now, but like to get a movie out in less than a year, it's kind of tough for guys like us. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I, I believe that's kind of like uh, Jackie Brown needed a little bit more work to be like Pump Fiction height. Uh, I like Jackie Brown, and I think I think they've heard that. Like at that point. Tarantino was kind of burnt out. Yeah, but it's kind of funny now. Uh, Jackie Brown is pretty beloved. Like, yeah, it finally yeah, no, got it's... there. But when, yeah, when you see it, and you see it after Pulp Fiction, you're like, ah, it's great, but it's not Pulp Fiction, it's... you know? <laughs> and the thing is, is, like, it's not supposed to be Pulp, right. Pulp Fiction either. It's It was supposed to be its own... 70s kind of um i forget what type of movie they call it black exploitation yeah but it wasn't pure exploitation film Mm. it it was more of a laid back right you know it it was supposed to be a laid back movie it did its job really well it had some shocking moments but i remember at the time like in the late 90s early 2000s there were people who worked on the film quentin tarantino one of them he's just like i really like jackie brown i think we could have changed it just a little bit but as a whole, everyone seemed to like it who worked on it. I like it. Yeah. It just... It's never going to be the excitable one. Yeah, and it, yeah. May, and it may come from, you know, they rushed this, it seems. Mm-hmm. And then they jumped right into From Dust Till Dawn after that. Yeah. He may just not have had the time to spend because then... I don't think he did. Because uh-huh. when, you, when you think about it now, like Tarantino takes four or five years off before doing another movie and he's working on the script and like Mm -hmm. obviously it paid off really well with once upon a time in hollywood which we've kind of briefly talked about in every episode a little bit is is a really fucking good movie like i think the one it paid off the most is inglorious bastards yeah and he definitely took a huge chunk of time off in between the kill bills to do inglorious bastards so Mm -hmm. it he had he had some time to really craft that and that's why he fucking uh oh no i was gonna say he won the screen he didn't win screenplay for that he won screenplay again for Django. actually what's it Django? yeah he won which is kind of crazy because this one is kind of inglorious i'm pointing to it because it's in front of us um inglorious was kind of I feel like a bigger one than Django, but then he won for Django. It's a good script, though. For uh, yeah, I get it. I mean, there's a lot of movies, but uh, if I had to come up with like a top three, I think Inglorious Bastards is gonna hit three. I just, you know, there's just so much in that movie that I can rewatch over and over and over. Love it. Uh, but I think Pulp would have to be one, two. It's either gonna be True Romance. Or maybe I don't know. That's really hard. I like I like I'm so I'm I'm an early guy for Tarantino. I like Pulp Fiction. I like Reservoir Dogs. I like True Romance. I like From Dusk Till Dawn. Uh, but like the recent ones, my prior two recent favorites are the new one. Uh, I think I Once like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I like Once Upon a Time better than yeah. the Django's and the Ingloriouses. Um, uh, and uh, Death Proof. I think Death Proof yeah, is a fucking masterpiece. <laughs> and I have that somewhere here. That's oh, right in front right of me here. here. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think ah, there we go. I think that's his uh I think that's his most recent masterpiece in my I mind. Love Death Proof. I think it's fucking amazing and I hope more people continue to find it now. Yeah. Nobody I, saw it when it came out. So. I don't know why those grindhouses didn't do well. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, it's just like, it did spawn a whole fucking genre, though, of really terrible B movies uh, for a while, for a yeah. couple of years, <laughs> with the fake uh, filters and uh, missing well, scenes and stuff. Oh, there were some yeah. brutally bad ones that came yeah. out around that time. Well, that's because it was just hacks doing it. Yeah, it's like you got to have the masters do it. <laughs> it's these guys. Well, what they would do is, you know, they'd be like, "Hey, I need you to come up with something. Uh, you got three months." And you know, like with Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, they'd been thinking about these things for years. Yeah, uh, Death Proof. He had thought since the '90s he wanted to do yeah. it. He had had an idea. So when you're like telling people to rush through it, and it's not their idea, you always get a hack job. Yeah. Because they're going back, they're stealing, but they're not stealing to improve. They're just like, I, I don't know what to stealing, do. Yeah. I'm not, this isn't my thing. I guarantee you that's what happened. It happens in all, it happens in horror movies all the time. Yeah. In stupid comedies that aren't funny. Yeah. Ugh. But uh, yeah, that's gonna, that's pretty much it for Four Rooms. If I had to put something in our museum, I would say you need another polish. 
Yeah, I, would, I just put the misbehaviors uh, in, you know, this, yeah. in the museum. It's a great story. I'd watch it again. Well, uh, one of us had to put the misbehaviors. It yeah, was our favorite. Yeah, but. so that's that's going in there. It's it's a good enough story. I think this movie's worth it though. It got fourteen. If you look it up on Rotten Tomatoes, it's fourteen yeah. percent. That's and people low. hated this movie when it came out. I don't hate it. It's got problems. It's it's rushed. But there's some good there's some good stuff in every story. Yeah. And so it's it it's just all around needed to be really tightened up. And so it's not bad, but it's yeah. It is what it is. I like it. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, if I was a tomato meter, it'd probably be more around 40. I'd go higher, for me, anyway. I, yeah, I, I, I go in the 60s, probably, maybe, you know. Well, I, I like, like it. I had to stop this movie um, a couple times. I was like, I'm just bored. And 404 really did it. Like, the first one, I was like, it's passable, it's fine, but I stopped the movie. Yeah, that was Then good. I watched 404, and I'm like... 404 is not... Yeah, that one really slogs the movie down. Yeah, and it was like the classic where you stop, and you're like, I'm going to go get something to eat. And <laughs> yeah. Like it. And then you come back, and you're like, ah, okay, I'll, I got to finish it. And the, but Misbehaviors, totally worth it. The Misbehaviors, totally worth it. Man from Hollywood. It's got some... It's some, got, yeah. it's a Tarantino yeah. thing. It's doing a Tarantino no. thing. But so. 12%, that's entirely too low. That's, no. No. That's, un, that's unwarranted, in my opinion. Yeah. But come back next week for our last Tarantober. Our which... Halloween episode. Ooh, it's spooky. It won't be that spooky. It Everyone's be... seen this movie. Yeah, but it's going to be so good. damn good. Oh, man, I might have to put that. That would be a tough one other than the Mount Rushmore of Tarantino. <laughs> come back and find yeah, out more. Come back and find out. Bye. Click. <laughs>